Despite the loud debates over deliveries of Leopard tanks, Europe isn't divided if it comes to military support for Ukraine, as long as the country needs it. That's what Edgar Srinkavich, Latvia's foreign minister, told us in our interview with him. Mr. Rinkavich, one year ago Russia launched what it still calls a special military operation in Ukraine. Your country, Latvia, has had a long history, a dramatic history with Russia and a common border. How has your perspective on Russia changed over this year? Not much. I think that uh, from our historic perspective, we did expect that Russia is going to launch kind of imperial or post-colonial war. I think that we were warning the rest of the world that this is going to happen. Well, to some extent even we were a bit optimistic some years ago, uh, before actually 2014, before Russia occupied Crimea, thinking that there is a chance that probably the cooperation between Russia and European Union, Russia and the West would actually transform the country. Did the West, above all Western European countries, Western leaders, uh, like Germans or the French, uh, neglect the danger from Russia? I think that there was underestimation of the danger. Uh, but I would say that, unfortunately, what I sometimes see, that many of our friends in the West are very often obsessed with the process, less with the result. Should Europe have paid more attention to the warnings coming from the Baltics? Look, uh, I know that this is very tempting sometimes to say we told you so. Uh, I know that this is very tempting now to say that we knew that. Uh, let me say this a bit differently. I think that somehow we all kind of lived in the 1990s for too long. To some extent, from time to time, we were also kind of trying to be nice and polite, not to look like the usual suspects, uh, not to look like, you know, a bit too crazy. To some extent, naive. On the other hand, yes, indeed, I think that the biggest mistake that I would name was the dependency on Russian energy sources. Mr. Nikovic, uh, what about today? One gets the impression that uh, you personally, together with your colleagues from Estonia and Lithuania, are calling for significantly uh, tougher or stronger actions, reactions towards Russia for example, than, for example, Germany or uh, Western European countries. Will the Baltic countries be going their own way in the future? No. Uh, I think that uh, this is part of the process. If we wouldn't be calling for tougher actions, we wouldn't be getting even what we are getting. Because there are also some colleagues calling for soft action. But let me say you this. I don't find too many differences with my German colleague. I think that Annalena Werbock is also having a very strong stance and I would say that I very much agree with her take on what we should do. Italy's head of government recently criticized uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky's trip to Brussels. Uh, Hungary is reluctant to criticize Putin. Germany drags its feet when it comes to arms deliveries. Uh, what is your impression? Is uh, Europe pulling together or is there a growing divide within the EU over this war? Now, I think I will come to the defense of the German government, a big surprise of Deutsche Welle. Uh, first of all, let's Let's be clear, a lot of countries, including Germany, do a lot of things. Sometimes the problem is not what they do, but how it looks like. Mm. The communication. The problem is that sometimes, before decisions are taken, uh, you have this kind of the situation where you are discussing, while the, de the decision is not taken, things seem to be a bit different. The fact that, yes, it was a bit drama, of deciding on tanks. Yes, it was a bit drama in the past deciding on other things. At the end of the day, those decisions are there. And also Ukrainians are acknowledging that there is a constant stream of military equipment and help from Germany, from Italy, from Spain, from other countries. Hungary is a bit different case, but again, yes, uh, I think that we all uh, have strong differences, but then if we make decisions or those decisions at least are not blocked. This is also 
the positive dynamic. This is still not the Soviet Union, this is still the European Union. So it's not so, how to say, bad as it sometimes looks like, but yes, indeed, it's worked. The tension is running high. This country, this society in Latvia wants to have more help to Ukraine. Let's talk a little bit uh, about your country. Latvia is one of the loudest or strongest critics of this war, uh, but the price your country has had to pay is also high. Um, your country has sent 1% of GDP to Ukraine as military aid. At the same time, higher energy prices uh, have been driving inflation up to 20%. Uh, and this war, it seems, is uh, far away from over. Um, how willing is Latvia to continue to make sacrifices uh, should this war go on for months or even years? I think that people here in Latvia and also in other Baltic states vividly remember 1914, the Soviet tanks rolling in, the occupation of Latvia. This is what happened in Crimea. What happened also with this invasion of Ukraine is a very, very strong emotional reminder of our not so distant history. And there are still people who remember what happened at the end of 1930s, beginning of 1940s. There are still people who lived through Siberia. They were kids at that point, but they still have those memories. So uh, from that point of view, yes, indeed, uh, what is the general feeling here in this society? Yes, we paid the price. Yes, we uh, do have a lot of challenges. The problem is that we understand if Ukraine does not win, if Ukraine does not withstand the Russian aggression, then the security situation, not only in Europe, but the world is going to be completely different. And then probably the price we are going to pay would be much, much higher. Mr. Rinkevich, speaking on the Western solidarity or Western military support for Ukraine, um, and the fear of a potential escalation, um, how long should the West deliver weapons, arms to Ukraine? As long as it takes, as long as Ukraine fights this war, as long as Ukraine liberates its territories. Some German intellectuals, especially on the left, um, have published a so-called Manifesto for Peace, uh, in which they are calling for uh, uh, an end to German arms deliveries to Ukraine and immediate negotiations with Russia. What do you think of negotiations? I don't know how many of those people have visited Ukraine after the war. Probably they should go to Ukraine, they should see mass graves, they should see devastation of Bucha, of Irpen, of energy grid. That's one. Second, I just wonder what are they going to negotiate with and about, taking into account that Russia is not going to negotiate. It's saying that Ukraine must surrender. So from that point of view, I think that uh, this is a bit ridiculous to hear such kind of calls. Uh, in effect, uh, understanding that, and I think that especially German intellectuals should take a look back on their country's history, remembering that if you don't stop aggressor, aggressor continues. There is not going to be long-lasting peace. There is going to be even some kind of probably uh, little period of time, small period of time, when there is no military activity, Russia regroups and Russia would attack Ukraine again. Those intellectuals probably should watch with some translation, I understand, Russian propaganda channels. I think that that hatred that uh, you can see, listen from chief propaganda officers of the Russian state against Ukrainians, against the West, is I would say comparable to the Nazi Germany, to, 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 to Hitler's propaganda machine. But Mr. Rikavich, at some point this war will be over. Uh, does Ukraine need to win no matter what price? This is the matter of the survival of Ukraine. And that's the price. One of uh, the consequences of this war is growing dislike towards uh, not only the Kremlin, Putin, but also ordinary Russians, uh, people living in Russia. Here in Latvia, one third of your population speak Russian. How did this war change the way between Russians and Latvians living here together? We still have in a situation where many of the Russians living here in Latvia either do not have strong opinions or waiting for how this war is ending, 
There are those who are supporting Ukraine, but there are also those who are supporting Russia. So this is a very mixed picture. Mm, but is, it, is Latvia a divided country in this way? Well, it's, uh, it's a very interesting question. I do believe that we still are in the process where we are trying to find a common ground when it comes to, 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 to the war in Ukraine. But also, like it or not, one of the litmus tests is your attitude against the war of Ukraine, against Russia, its aggression, and also how you uh, treat uh, Ukrainian refugees. But are we, uh, Russians living here in Latvia who sympathize with Russia, with the Kremlin, dangerous for Latvia? I think that we certainly do not need to exaggerate the feelings of the Russians here. But we also are rather very careful to analyze also different uh, opinions, also some actions. And yes, those who are openly expressing their aggression against other citizens. There have been limited number of incidents with Ukrainian flags involved and others. Then they are, of course, a bit, uh, they are held uh, accountable. Do you wish there were fewer uh, Russians living in Latvia? Look, uh, Less. that number of Russians that now lives in Latvia is part of our Soviet occupation legacy. Uh, I do believe that what we need to do is we need to address some of those issues of legacy of the Soviet occupation, we need to find a way how to more involve those Russians who are willing to be part of Latvia in their daily life. But we also need to understand that there is going to be the group that is never going to be part of this community. And Mr. Inkevich, my last question is, uh, can you imagine uh, good neighborly relations with Russia considering Russia will stay, will be forever your neighbor? What is the time perspective we are talking about? Ten years, hundred years, thousand years? When this war is over. Uh, there are actually two scenarios. One is Russia fails. You can also have another option where Russia feels that it won. In the first case, most probably you are going to have humiliated and defeated Russia and certainly large parts of population seeking some kind of revenge. On the other hand, the country that thinks that it's unstoppable. Let's go further. Uh, both scenarios do not sound very optimistic to me. Whatever scenario there is, we will need to address security of what we call eastern border. I think that uh, what we see on our borders, especially with Belarus and Russia, that's a major challenge, and uh, that kind of situation of guarding border, protecting border, is going to be the long term, no matter what kind of scenario we have with Russia. Second, I do believe that the presence of NATO allies and presence of our friends should be here for a long term. I would wish that Russia is democratic. I would wish that Russia uh, is able to close this charter and really to start where it ended actually back in 1990s. And that depends really very much now on Russia itself, not so much on this country. Edgar Srinkevich, Latvian Foreign Minister, thank you for this interview.